And now, back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. And hey, welcome back to Inside West Virginia Politics. The year in review, 2018, one of the big scandals, big problems we saw here, Adrian, at the, the Capitol was the Rise West Virginia program. We had these horrible floods in 2016, only to find out that millions, I forget what the total was, $150 million that was sent by Washington wasn't being spent. Well, I think one thing that has in common with the Supreme Court scandal is the fact that confidence was lost in the government. A lot of these people not only have waited years for the help that they desperately need, but you forget that a lot of these people had gotten help from FEMA and then had to pay some of that money back to get help from RISE, ultimately help that they ended up waiting on and weren't getting calls back from. Was that, she mentions the similarity to, the, I mean, they're two different issues, maybe they're apples and oranges, but it raised that old question, Brad, of who's minding the store here and watching the state's money? Yeah, you know, the, gov the federal government has uh, made available millions of dollars that should be helping West Virginians on their path to recovery. And the common thread through both of those issues has been, is West Virginia using that resource wisely? Is it using it carefully, responsibly? And the jury is out, you know. I'm, I think there has been improvement in how that resource is used, but boy, it's been questionable. That, yeah, story, that story right there could also be the number one story in 2019. And to jump on Brad's point here, between HUD putting West Virginia, categorizing it as a slow spender, which is not a list you want to be on, and FEMA putting West Virginia under a manual reimbursement policy, which changes how money is given for big projects and when, which we are on that list alone with Puerto Rico, the federal government seems to be raising two eyebrows at West Virginia, and it's just going to be a problem when the next flood hits, because all signs seem to point to more flooding, not the end of all flooding. and. We're not in a good position with the federal government. Well, it's a state prone to flooding. It's going to happen again. Let's talk about another federal program that we saw this year, the big, massive $8 billion opioid bill that was passed by Congress, signed by the president. I had the good fortune to go to the White House for the bill signing and do some stories there about it. Uh, $8 billion. Did anybody have an opinion on whether this is going to work or not? I mean, the money's designated for law enforcement, enforcement, prevention, and treatment, but is it enough? Or is this just throwing a lot of money at a problem and hoping some of it sticks to the wall? You know, <laughs> something has to be done. We got to try some things. Yeah. That opioid issue is something that deals with, um, it affects the state's economy in terms of participation in the workforce. It affects families. Uh, it affects people's health. It affects uh, whether kids are, are have the solid background of, of a, a family to, to get them through the school day. Uh, it, it just affects everything and something has to be done to try. Yeah, one of the things I was struck, and Adrian, I know when I was in D.C., you and I talked about this on the air, was the fact that this was one of the most bipartisan bills we've ever seen in modern times. I think the vote in the Senate was 99 to 1. It was, you know, 400 and something to 24 in the, in the House. That rarely happens in D.C. <laughs> Big surprise. Well, I think if you're left or right, Republican, Democrat, you know there's a problem. And we have to do something about it. So this is a good start. Is it enough money? A lot of people are saying it's not. You're throwing just a little bit at this huge problem. And you really need to fight this as if it's a war. Yeah. But it is a good start. And um, this is a bill that had West Virginia's name all over it, obviously. You talked to David Grubb, who sadly he and his wife lost their daughter. Right. And part of the law was named after her. Exactly. Uh, Jesse's bill, that was part of it with she lost her battle with the opioid addiction and he wanted to do something about it so he started a grassroots effort to try to uh, help doctors better communicate with addicts for their future um, help and but again that's just one piece that West Virginia really helped with with this na nationwide bill. It's interesting because the old fight has always been do we more law enforcement do we throw more people in jail or do we put money in treatment beds did we get a good mix in this Jake do you think? You know, I'm not as familiar with the federal legislation, but on the $8 billion figure, I think it's some perspective is good here. West Virginia has about a $4.2 billion budget, so that's a really big influx of money. And yeah, part of the question is where is it going to go? Are we going to prioritize treatment versus law enforcement? Are we going to maybe crack open some of these drug laws, expand drug courts? I mean, there's still a lot to be decided on how that money is used. It was fascinating. They really stole ideas, ripped off ideas from West Virginia. The quick response teams in Huntington's uh, modeling Lily's Place to treat addicted babies. And so a lot of this federal legislation, a lot of good came out of the bad in West Virginia and the programs we have that are working were mimicked. I think some of the, one of the good moves is Bob Hansen being appointed in the position that he has from the treatment side of things. Bob is a, a veteran of 
treating scenarios of this type. And I think that was one of the moves here late in the year that will move us forward in some of the help of this scenario. Well, I think we agree. We all hope it works. We know how horrifying this uh, epidemic has been on our state with the opioid crisis. All right, we're gonna have one more segment on Inside West Virginia Politics. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break.